Hi there. Thank you for joining me once again in our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. We are in chapter 13. We're going to pick up in verse 8 and we're going to go down to the end of chapter uh, verse 13. My name is Stuart Gould and it is such a pleasure for me to bring this message to you. We are going to be talking today about this love chapter. We're going to be talking about it in a little bit different way because there is a verse here that divides the church into two camps. This verse, oftentimes people don't realize it or understand it, but this verse is actually the one that has divided the church into two camps and, and the two camps oftentimes have a difficulty working together. So come with me today as we look at this and see if we can bring some clarity to what it is actually saying in this verse. Once again, thank you for joining me in our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. As I mentioned already, we're in chapter 13 and we're going to start in verse 8. Last time we talked about love and how without love, the things that we do have no value. And then we talked about what love is, that it love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking, not easy anger. It is patient. It is kind. It is not proud. All these things about love, we won't go over them again because we went through them pretty good last time, but they're important. Today we're going to start at verse 8 and this is an important thing because these verses seem insignificant in some ways and oftentimes we just read over them and we look at them we think that they're good or whatever but there's a huge divide in the church that results from these verses and this is what I want to deal with today. So let's read, let's start from verse 8 and let's read down to the end of verse 10. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. The controversy we have here really stems from verse 10, where it says, when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. Now, we know in the church today that we have a couple of trains of thought. We have charismatic movement and the non-charismatic people that there's a divide in the line. Some people believe that all the charismatic things, speaking in tongues, healing, all that sort of thing, prophecy, all ended. And others believe that it is still in effect. And this is where this thought comes from. This is where the dividing point is. I remember a number of years ago talking to a guy who didn't believe in the things of the Holy Spirit, who didn't believe in healing and prophecies and stuff. He thought it was all gone. I said to him, I said, you know, really, we have a disagreement on one verse. And he says, oh, we disagree on a lot more than one verse. And I said, that's true, but it all comes from this one verse where it says, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. Where the confusion comes in is in our interpretation of what the perfect is. Now, for those who do not lend themselves to the charismatic thinking, they believe that the perfect that is talking about here, they believe that it is a written word of God. So when the Bible came into being, when Paul had written it and the Bible was compiled, that that was the end of the miraculous. That was the end of the healing. That was the end of the speaking in tongues and all that sort of thing, that it was not necessary there. Now, those who are on the more charismatic side of the page, they believe that when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. They believe that the perfect that is talking about here is Jesus. So this is where the controversy comes between the charismatic and the non-charismatic lines of the church. It's important for us to look at this because we need to make a decision in our own life. Now, I personally hold to the fact that I think when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away as Jesus. 
I do not believe that this is written word. The written word is valuable to us. The written word can lead us to Jesus. But that's what it is. It is a roadmap that leads us to Jesus. It is not life itself. The life is not in this word. This is like an owner's manual to bring us to the life. It is an owner's manual to, to lead us to Jesus. However, if we take this as the source of light, if we take this word as the eternity that we can achieve, then we have a tendency to believe that all these things passed away when the word came into being. Now, of course, like I said, when I was having the discussion with this guy, he said, oh, we, agree, we disagree on a lot more verses than just that one. And I said, yeah, you're right. But it is foundation of our understanding of this verse that changes everything, right? Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Okay, there's a time when prophecies are going to stop. Where there are tongues, they will be still. There will be no need to have tongues. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect will disappear. So let's look at this a little bit. Okay, love never fails. We know that we have love. We know that love is important. We know that the whole reason that we exist is because of love. And we were created to love and to be loved. We were first created to love God and to be loved by God. And secondly, we were created to love and be loved by one another. So love is something that never fails. So even whether it is the completion of this word or if it's the coming of Jesus, it doesn't change that because love never fails. Love is going to continue for an eternity because that is the whole purpose and the reason that God has sent Jesus to us. So let's look at the others though. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. If we adopt the understanding that what the written word was the perfect and the prophecies are done away with, what about all the prophetic words in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus? What about the words in the Bible about how the world is gonna get worse and worse and worse? What about the prophetic words that we look at? We see the world in the way it is today, and we can see these scriptures, these prophetic words being fulfilled right before our eyes. If these were all done away with at the time that the word was compiled, then why are we still seeing these prophetic words? Why is there still prophecy that is unfolding right before our eyes? The book of Revelation hasn't even begun yet. You know, that was the very end times. That was the end when everything was going to open up. I mean, there are parts of it that have already, but it's important for us to understand that, right? Where there are tongues, they will cease. Our tongues haven't ceased. Now, some people will say, well, this is just talking about spiritual tongues. But, you know, I, I think it's going to be more than that because in our physical body, we need the tongue to communicate. I'm not sure that it's going to be the same thing in heaven. I'm not sure it's going to be spoken word or if it's just going to be thoughts to, to one another. We're not clear on that, but definitely there are a multitude of, of languages and tongues that are here. Now, maybe they think it's only talking about spiritual tongues where we pray in the spirit or we sing in the spirit or whatever the case may be. But Paul tells us that how important tongues are. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. If Paul, he's in the new covenant, he's given us in the written word, he's given us instructions to do this, that this is a good thing for us to do. And then all of a sudden it's going to disappear and it's not there for us. So you have to wonder on some of the instructions that Paul's given us, if it's not going to last beyond the compiling of the Bible. And then the other one is, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Well, knowledge has not passed away from us. This is something we are gaining as we grow. As we grow in the Lord, we, we gain more knowledge by studying His Word, by walking with Him, by experiencing the things that He has us experiencing. We grow in knowledge. I look at myself now, and in my age now, where I am compared to where I was in the beginning, I know there's a great amount of understanding and revelation and knowledge that the Lord has given me.
I remember the first time we came to Malawi 32 years ago and I spoke my first message in Malawi and I still remember what I spoke on. I spoke on Romans chapter 8 and we were in this meeting and the first time we were here and speaking, first time speaking through an interpreter, I shared on the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8. And it took about an hour, an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes or something with an interpreter. Now, if I was to speak on Romans chapter 8, that would be a three-day session to, to get through all of the understanding that the Lord has revealed through that. So knowledge hasn't passed away. It says here, we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't understand everything. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will disappear. We look around us and the imperfect hasn't disappeared. You know, there's a lot of imperfections around us. There's a lot of imperfections in our own lives. And they haven't disappeared yet. Why? Because the perfect hasn't come yet. The, well, the perfect came in the form when Jesus came and was born on the earth, but he was taken away and, and is talking here about the second coming. I believe it's talking about the second coming of Jesus when the end of this age and this earth are going to be done away with and we are going to rejoice with him. So when we look at it in that way, we see how these two divisions can be so opposed to each other. Oftentimes when you have meetings of a number of different churches together and these churches come together, oftentimes there ends up being a separation because the charismatic and the non-charismatic, their theology and their thinking is so different that they can't do all together. A lot of people get, uh, who are non-charismatic get offended by tongues. A lot of people who are charismatic aren't careful with their tongues and they offend their brothers. And we need to be careful of doing that kind of thing, right? It's important for us to understand that what's important is that we keep our eyes on Jesus. I believe here that it's not talking about the written word. Am I saying that the written word has no value? No, I am not saying that whatsoever. The written word has value. If you go to John chapter 5, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he says, you think by studying the word, you think by pouring yourself into the word and knowing the word that you will obtain eternal life. But the word tells you about me. It tells you that I am coming into the world. It is through me that you obtain eternal life. It is through Jesus that we obtain eternal life. The word that we have is important for us. And don't get me wrong. I spend a lot of time studying this word. I preach between 12 and 20 times a week. So I'm always in this word. I have to be always in this word. I'm reading and I'm studying because I know it helps me to understand God. It helps me to understand the nature of God. It helps me to understand what Jesus did for me. It helps me to understand what he desires for us. And I grow in understanding and in knowledge. And as I grow in understanding and knowledge, then I'm able to share it with other people because I only know in part. All of us, we only know in part. We don't have all understanding. The understanding continues as we grow. I think it's important for us to see that, that we are walking with God in a way that we come and learn who he is and what he has done for us. In verse 11, he said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things behind me. He's talking about the growth process, right? The growth of knowledge. He knows what's coming, right? Now we see, but poor reflection in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. This is also talking about the same thing, right? Right now we see in part. We look in a mirror, but it's a dim mirror. It's it's not like the mirrors that we have nowadays that are nice and clear. The old mirrors, you can hardly see yourself in them, right? It was a dim reflection. But he says the time is coming when we will see face to face. Well, that face to face, that full understanding has not come yet because we're still learning. We're still trying to understand the things of God. We're still trying to understand what he's done. We're studying the word and pouring over it. Those things haven't come to being yet. So that takes away from... Verse 10 that says, when the perfect comes, the imperfect will disappear. That knowledge, that part knowledge, that being able to see a reflection only dimly, 
will disappear. We know in part, we shall know, but then we shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. We are going to understand when we get to heaven, when this we're taking from this earth, when we're taking out of this body, then we're going to understand because we're not going to have the restrictions of this body. We're not going to have the restrictions of this earth that we live in. In verse 13, he says, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. This is the important thing for us to understand, even in looking at verse 10, that has brought a great division in the church, the most important thing is for us to love one another. I'm part of a group in Blantyre that we call Blantyre City Church, and it's a group of people from many different denominations, both charismatic and non-charismatic, and we come together once a week and we have a service there. And the question of charismatic and non-charismatic never comes up. There are some people that speak in tongues there when they're in the service, and there's others that do other different things. It never is a problem because we're there to accept each other and to love each other. It's never a situation. It comes down to us having love for one another, right? I mean, that's the greatest thing. All these things we argue about and we debate about and whatever, yeah, there's some point to it. But the important thing is, are we living in love? Are we exalting our love. I mean, that's what this whole chapter is about, right? I mean, that's why he starts out this chapter. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, what am I? Just a resounding gong and a noisy cymbal, right? If I have gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and have faith that could move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Without love, we are nothing. That's the important thing, right? Whatever we do needs to come out of the love that is in us. It has to flow out of us. I think what we're looking at here is very important for us to look at, especially on verse 8, 9, and 10, uh, well, 11, and 12, and 13, actually everything we covered here today, that we spend some time meditating and asking the Lord to give us a revelation because what ends up happening when we understand this as a written word, there's so much that is robbed from us. We restrict the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. We restrict us from learning and understanding the things that God has for us. And so I really encourage you to open your heart and to be free that you can talk about these things and you can discuss it with your friends and that you can go to the Lord and you can spend some time meditating on it so that you can come to an understanding of what God is talking about here. Because it's important for us to realize this isn't just about the written word, but it's about life. It's about Jesus. He is the the giver of life. He's the one. I was telling some people in a devotional today that Many years ago, I used to listen to the Bible on tapes and I could go through the whole Bible in under two weeks and I would do it over and over and over again as I was working, I was driving truck. One of the things that I come to understand as I was listening to the Bible over and over again, that from Genesis chapter one to the end of Revelations, it's about Jesus. It's all about him. He is the perfect, he is the one. And even in Revelations, when you look at Revelations, when they come to open the seals of the book, and John says that they looked in heaven, and they looked on earth, and they looked everywhere, and they could not find anyone who was worthy to open the seals of the book. It tells us there in Revelation that John cried for about half an hour, that he weeped because there was nobody found worthy. But then the angel came to him and said, no, John, stop, don't weep anymore. There is one. There is one who is worthy, the lamb that was slain. He is worthy to open the seals, and his name is Jesus. He is the one who is our perfection, right? We're way over our time here today, so thank you for joining me. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the perfecter. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, help us to set our eyes on him and help us to do everything that we do out of the love that you have deposited in us, that everything we do can touch people in a heart way. And we just thank you, Father, that you care for us and that you love us. And we thank you that you are walking hand in hand with us. Father, we just love you so much and we just, um, we just, 
ask you just to love people through us, Lord, even the difficult ones, even the ones who are hard to love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So once again, thank you for joining me. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. We'll see you next time.